we have a do we have a clicker? Is there a, is there a, oh it's there. Hello, good evening. Um my name is, is Lee Harrison. Um sorry I don't worry. Uh, and I was I was born in nineteen eighty nine and that apparently makes me a millennial. Um and I love the obvious things that millennials do, poncing about on rooftops and attending weekly cheese parties. It's my sort of thing. Um, but what that also means is that I am lucky enough to be one of the first people in the entire history of the human race to have grown up with video games for my entire life. They were there for the whole thing. And it's amazing because they have clearly impacted me and, and, and made me who I am today, which is a good thing. Um, but as a millennial as well, I, I also have this sort of inbuilt um, feeling that I, I have the ability to be great at everything. Not just good at stuff, but really fantastically amazing. Um, and, and we're sort of born with this, aren't we, as, as, as the youth. We're born with it, but it's also propagated by, by the internet that we're all connected to constantly. Um, you know, optimistic quotes, uh, the, the achievements of our peers, and stuff like the Forbes 30 under 30. It's everywhere. We can achieve things that no other person can. Um, and that's, that's really why I'm here tonight, not because I want to. Um, I hate public speaking. Um, and as you'll soon find out, I've got very little of import to say about video games. Um, I'm, I'm here tonight because my entire sense of self-worth and self-esteem is based on what I achieve, not how happy I am or whether I'm surrounded by loved ones, family and friends. No, it's what I achieve. Um, and actually, for the last week trying to put this together, I've been entirely miserable, stomping around my flat, playing at being the sort of tortured artist uh, to my, my lovely fiancé who's put up with me as I, as I put together a 15-minute talk on video games. It shouldn't, <laughs> shouldn't really be that difficult, should it? But, but I made it really, really hard. Um, and I was originally meant to be here to talk about Resident Evil 2, and, and how it made me feel as a kid and how it impacted me growing up. Um, but I had to scrap two versions of this over the weekend. Um, so the words I'm speaking to you now, I came up with yesterday, essentially. Uh, and it's going all right so far. Um, I hope. The, uh, the, first, the first attempt um, w was me trying to tell this story about um, a sort of emotional awakening that I went through as a kid when I came across this corridor in, uh, in Resident Evil 2. And as a, as, a little, as a little boy, I was, I was drawn towards the end of this room where the moon sort of hangs solemnly in the sky. I don't know if you can make it out. Um, and I know what you might be thinking, that's, that's not the moon, Lee. That's, that's a light bulb. And you have been a bit foolish. Um, and I was, yes, I got it wrong. Uh, and the whole crux of, of that particular story was me seeing what I thought was the moon and... Um, and becoming really sad because I wanted to climb this wall and get to the moon and run away from all the zombies, and I couldn't. And it made me miserable. Um, and and, and the, the sort of point that I was going to shoehorn into that was, was that that feeling was, was an emotional awakening, and I came to terms with my own mortality. Um, and the sort of payoff was, was going to be that, that I realized many years later, going back to play it as an adult, that, that what I'd seen didn't really exist, but that it didn't matter because I'd... I'd felt it, and therefore the truth wasn't, wasn't really that crushing. Um, it's a good idea, I think. I don't know. No smiles, but, but <laughs> I thought it was a pretty good idea, but it, it took me about a minute there to, to sort of paraphrase it, and, and I've got another 10 left, so, so I had to scrap it. But I, I, I got sort of fixated by this idea of, of um, reality not necessarily mattering if the emotional response to that fake reality didn't mean, uh, was meaningful, sorry. Um, and I think that's, that's quite a prescient thing to think about these days. Now we're living in a, in a sort of post-truth society. Ooh. Um, so, so I decided to hastily try and rewrite it uh, into some sort of satire of, of, um, of our increasingly <laughs> fractured society. And I thought I'd be really clever. And, and every time I spoke about zombies, I actually meant immigrants, right? And I sort of wrote this horrible um, fake version of myself um, becoming a little bigger, a little 10-year-old bigger while playing Resident Evil 2. 
So instead of a sort of positive emotional awakening where I, I sort of learnt more about myself by not being able to, to run away from my problems, I instead sort of internalised them and decided that they weren't my problems, they were the zombies, the immigrants' problems. And therefore, as a little kid, I'd, I'd develop this sort of bigotry and, and I'd be able to come up on stage and say, you know, really humorous things like, when them zombies came here, right, over here to Raccoon City, right, it was better before the zombies came and we had jobs and the NHS worked and all that sort of stuff. Um, and, and again, I thought, it's hilarious, isn't it? It's really smart and really funny. Um, but the problem with that take on it was, was I couldn't come up with a punchline that, that sort of stopped me looking like a racist. <laughs> and, and I don't want to look like a racist because I'm not, I'm not. Some of my best friends... Um, <laughs> So I had to scrap that as well. Now, if it, I'm sure someone funnier or wittier than me would have been able to pull it off, but, but I can't. And that's, that's sort of my problem and why I'm here tonight, because I couldn't come up with anything better to say to you all, and I'm sorry that you paid to come and see this. <laughs> um, but but, but I, I, it, it sort of got me thinking, why, why, why am I still here if I clearly haven't got anything to say and I've had to scrap two versions of what I wanted to say um, and it is because I, I constantly feel the need to achieve something to push myself beyond my comfort zone um, and that's 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 why I'm here um, and, and it sort of got me thinking how can I shoehorn something about video games into this to try and save it um, and, and it it got me thinking about how I used to play as a kid and how this, this constant need to be working towards something, to be achieving something, however difficult or, or impossible that might be, um, came from, from these sort of formative experiences. So I'd like to take you through how I think I've become such a horrible person as an adult. Um, patience. As a kid playing video games, I had absolutely zero patience. In fact, my mum used to finish all of my games for me before she gave them to me. Now, this is, this is a completely true story. It really happened. Um, and, and she used to do this because she knew that as soon as I ran into some sort of roadblock, like actually being challenged, I would just stop playing whatever I'd been given. So she finished everything for me to remove that sort of um, any, any, any form of challenge. Um, and I used to play an, an awful lot of... of platform games on the Game Boy, and obviously they have level select screens. And whenever I ran into trouble in a level, I'd just quit out, next level, doesn't matter. <laughs> and in that way, I was able to keep feeling like I was achieving something, moving forwards, even though I really wasn't. It was amazing, the best of both worlds. Um, and that sort of ties into to my lack of ability to repeat things. If I ever miss my stop on the tube, I'm not just going to toddle over to the other platform and go back. No, no. I'm going to leave the station, even in the pissing rain, and I'm going to find a bus, or I will walk to where I want to get to, just so I don't have to go back on myself. And this sort of manifested itself as a youngster in, in games. I, I, I will not play certain genres, like fighting games or racing games, because they are far too repetitive. Um, and the only games that I would play as a kid were shooters, right? and action games. And, and I know the irony's not lost, they are, they are really repetitive. <laughs> Probably some of the most repetitive games you could ever wish to find. Um, but their repetition is a sort of really, really tight loop of repetition. I do something, I get rewarded. I shoot something, a head explodes. I move somewhere, the game tells me I did a good job. It's amazing. So actually, the, the games that I thought were repetitive, they're not, are they, really? They're, they're actually quite cumulative. A fighting game, you have to learn combos. Lots of combos, lots of buttons, buttons, press them, press them. And, and, and it's difficult. The same with a driving game. And, and actually, they're a lot more like learning genuine skills, like learning how to drive properly, or, say, learning to play the bass guitar. Two things that I completely quit as a kid because they, they were too hard. And, and, and I, I sort of confuse repetition for, for things being difficult. And, and that's a problem because I have never, ever liked doing hard things. The only games I ever finished as a kid were ones I could cheat at. Um, 
the, the, the Grand Theft Auto trilogy on the PlayStation 2, never finished them properly, but if you give yourself guns, it's really, really easy to do. Type in that code, guns, guns, guns. I'm going to win. Um, <laughs> and Metal Gear Solid as well. I only ever finished that because I cheated, and this one's a doozy though. I used one of those, uh, you know, the cheat cartridges that you plugged into the back of the, uh, the PlayStation, and it sort of debugs the game. And, and I gave myself invisibility in a stealth game, right? Super clever. <laughs> and so I ran from beginning to end, and I didn't really have to interact with the whole game at all. It was super fun. Um, but as a byproduct of using the cheat cartridge, it garbled up all of the, the cutscenes that make up like 50% of Metal Gear Solid. So not only did I not play the game, I also have no idea what happens in it. <laughs> and I still, for whatever reason, have a sense of like, woo, achievement. I did something good. When really I didn't. I didn't do anything at all. But I still get that dopamine buzz. Um, and, and, and why bother trying to get good at anything when there's always a way of, of sort of circumventing the rules? And I know I shouldn't be saying this in a room full of people who sort of revere video games, but why bother if you can still, if you're such a simplistic individual as I am, if you can still get the dopamine buzz without having to try? And that is why I love big budget console games. Because they're so expensive to produce, they're not allowed to be difficult anymore. <laughs> you have to sell 10 million copies, you're not gonna make a complex game. So I can just sit there and let it wash over me. Move somewhere, well done, Lee. Woo! I don't know, you picked up a feather on a rooftop. Ice one, son. <laughs> and it's just like that, it's constant. Woo, pats on the back every time. Um, and that's great, that's great. I love relaxing. Um, but there, there is a problem and, and a sort of serious end point to this. I'm, I'm kind of worried that at some point I'm going to start living my actual human life like I play video games, constantly taking the easy way out. Constantly, you know, finding a way of, of, of just, I don't know, not bothering. And that would be horrible because I, I'd be sort of living up to the stereotype of a millennial that, the Daily Mail says I am. And that'd be horrible. Why would anyone want to legitimize anything written in the Daily Mail? And I suppose, in general, the sort of theme of, of what I've tried to say tonight and, and what I was trying to say with, with the, the aborted Resident Evil 2 things is that, yes, the way I play games has invariably sort of touched who I am as a person, but I don't think it's defined me in any way, because if I had, if it had, I'd be sat at home tonight, not, not trying, I'd be eating Ben and Jerry's, and having a better time, not stood on a stage here, sort of tearing apart my soul, in front of a room full of people. Um, but I, 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 I did, I came, and I, I sort of pushed myself to, to try and do something that's genuinely difficult for once. Um, and so I think maybe, maybe the, the misunderstanding of, of millennials is not that, that we, 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 we feel the world owes us something. It's, it's actually that we, we're so afraid of failure, but we want to put so much effort into doing a good job that we have to pretend that failure doesn't exist at all just to get out of bed and try because it's so hard. Um, and in that vein, if you've hated this and thought it was a complete waste of your time, please don't ever tell me. <laughs> just keep it to yourselves because it'll break my little heart. Um, I don't know if you found anything particularly interesting. Come and have a little word with me. I'll be over at the bar. Thank you very much. That's me as a kid.